Hello, everybody. How are you? Welcome to the live song. Hello, everybody. How are you? How are you? How are you? Welcome to the live song. Hello, everybody. How are you? How are you? Welcome to the live song. Hello, everybody. How are you? How are you? How are you? Welcome to the live song. Hello, everybody. How are you? How are you? How are you? Welcome to the live song. My own fault, and I'll apologize. You'll see soon because we're going to have some wonderful people. Fault, and I'll apologize. You'll see soon because we're going to have some wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. I I have some wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to wonderful people. And I'll apologize. You'll see soon. Regardless, I I just want to
oh, chat relay is gone. That might explain it. So one moment, we're going to put the chat relay back in because that's a very important part of the, of the session here. Ah, I think I know what's going on actually. So, right, right, right. So what's going on right now is that we are we are trying to figure out where the where the echo is from, and so while doing so, we actually took one of our key pieces of technology out of the system. Um, that's because let me explain as as on, on its way in. Okay. Uh, meanwhile, I see that in our discussion channel, our team is discussing who's going to bring this thing back in. But well, with, we actually have a particular piece of software here that makes it possible for everyone to have a discussion in a way where we can highlight the questions and the comments that we want to focus on. So if you'll bear with us, we always want to make sure that the system is working as smoothly as possible. Meanwhile, while it's coming in, maybe I'll make a few comments about Math Kangaroo. So Math Kangaroo is a contest that I personally didn't really notice until later because I've been doing other competitions like Math Counts, AMC8, and so on. But when I first saw the Math Kangaroo problems, I thought the people who make these are really creative because I found that quite often I'd look at it and wonder to myself, how do you do this? I should actually say the best part of doing math problems is when you get to do something that you don't know how to do. Because the ones that you don't know how to do, you actually get to learn something from. And so today, I hope that we'll get that experience as well. Today, the questions that we're going to be covering are questions on levels five and six. And level five and six corresponds roughly to people who are in grades five and six. It's also really fun to be discussing math kangaroo problems today because the actual math everyone's here, because the actual math kangaroo competition is going to be later this month. And meanwhile, I see that chat relay here is working, which is wonderful. Uh, and also we've resolved the echo problem. So I think every, everything, everything is here. And hello, everybody. As you can see, the live stream is now actually more lively. So with that, I'm going to, at this point, go ahead and introduce our, our, our leaders for today, our stars who are going to handle the stream. I'm not going to handle it because as you can see, I don't actually have a proper equipment set up. I'm on the road in China. I'm giving talks all around the world this particular week. And yes, hello, everybody, Math Kangaroo fans and all. Good to see all of you. And let me introduce them. Uh, in fact, I'll say them one at a time. We'll go in terms of alphabetical order by first name. So uh, I'll, I'll say something about them as they go up. But Aiden, could you just say a little hello and then you'll take over the screen and then I'll say something? Okay. Hello. Wonderful. That was Aiden Wen. Uh, Aiden Wen is actually a, a very experienced math competition person himself. He had participated in math counts competition and made it all the way to the national level for Texas. Um, that Texas, by the way, is one of the biggest states in the country. And that means that he was uh, one of the top four in the state of Texas. He also has continued doing all of these. He's the US, he was a USA JMO honorable mention, and he's the captain of his science poll team. Uh, the next person I'd like to introduce is our other co-star, Shelly. Hello. Great. And well, welcome to Shelly. And Shelly is also a National Math Counts competitor for the state of Nevada. Again, that means that she was one of the top four students in the state of Nevada in Math Counts when she was doing that middle school math competition. And she's also an Amy qualifier. And she also enjoys video production and piano. You should probably try to find her YouTube channel. It's pretty interesting. But with that, I'm going to hand it over to Aiden and Shelly and go ahead from here. All right. Hello, everyone. Looking forward to solving the math kangaroo problems with y'all. This will also be our first time seeing the problems. So we'll get to have that viewing the problems and then trying to solve that experience firsthand together. So without further ado, let's get into the first question. OK, question two says the Mayan people wrote numbers using dots and bars. A dot is written for a one and a bar for a five. So how do we write the number 17? Well, if we're going to write 17, we're going to have to figure out how many fives there are, right? So if we have 17, we can use one five. Let's see, that gets us 12, 12, another five. I see a lot of you guys already got the answer. Seven, seven minus five, that would be two. And since we can't have any more fives for two, that'll be one, two, three fives, and two circles. So that will be answer choice C. Great, nice and easy. Right, awesome. This problem is pretty cool because it's kind of like an introduction to what we call modular arithmetic. So you can actually write 17 in a different way, which is two mod 
five. So if you're familiar with that, this is another way of expressing modular arithmetic, which is pretty neat. All right, let's take a look at the next problem that we have here, which is number four. All right, looks like we're going through the even problems. So there are 14 girls and 12 boys in a kindergarten class. And if half of the children go for a walk, at least how many of them are girls? Okay, so let's write down what we know here. So we know that there are 14 girls and 12 boys. So it's probably helpful to know how many total children there are. And that's going to be 26 because 14 plus 12 is 26. Okay, and I see a lot of E's in the chat. So let's see if that's what it is. So half of the children go for a walk. We know that there's 26 of them. So that means 13 of them are out for a walk. And so therefore, well, if we have all of them be boys, right? If all of the boys go out for a walk, that's 12 people. But we still have one more person because we know that there are 13 people who go for a walk. So therefore, one of the girls must have gone for a walk as well. So that means we must have at least one girl who went on a walk and looks like that's going to be E as you guys have been saying in the chat. So great job, everyone. Yeah, I actually, I already like these problems a lot already because usually, you know, the easier problems are some of like the more boring questions. But I think the fact that we have to add these up and then divide by half, then consider, oh, we only have 12 boys. I think that's really cool for an early problem. Awesome. Okay, y'all are doing pretty good. Let's look at question six. Okay, so it looks like we are doing the even questions. Um, but for this one, it's a little bit different. Which of the following geometric figures is not in the design below? And we have some sort of like, this is like the, the designs you see on the glass or something like that. That's what it reminds me of. But we're given five shapes. And basically what we're trying to do now is to see if we can find the shape in here. If we can, we move on. If we can't, then that will be our answer. So first one, triangle. First one, triangle. Is there a triangle in here? Yeah, I see a lot of triangles, actually. There are these things in right here. And then square. Square also is right here. There's a square. Let me see if I can circle it or outline it. Yeah, there's a square. Hexagon. OK, this one's a little bit harder to see, but it's right here. There's a hexagon. What about octagon? Okay, looks like the chat doesn't think octagons in here, and I don't see an octagon either. So this is our tentative answer, but let's check E just in case. And regular dodecagon, that's a polygon with 12 sides, and we actually do have it. That'll be this very outer layer. Almost looks like a circle right here. So the answer, yes, will be D. Awesome. awesome. Wow. And yes, the first thing I thought with this too was it was some sort of tiling pattern on the glass. It's definitely a really pretty pattern that you might see elsewhere. And it's nice that we got to see that here too. All right. So with that, without further ado, let's look at our next problem, which is number eight. So number eight says, the six smallest odd natural numbers are written on the faces of a die. Tony throws it three times and adds the results. So which of the numbers cannot be the sum? So let's take a look at this. So the six smallest natural numbers. So it looks like that's going to be one, three, five, seven, nine, and 11. So maybe we could do some process of elimination, just like what Aiden was doing with the previous problem, right? Because here, we just need to find a number that cannot be the sum. But it looks like that's going to be kind of hard. At least with 21, it might be kind of tricky to find a combination. In this case, we're going to have 777 that makes 21. For B, we have 3, which is 111. And then for 19, we can find another combination, uh, perhaps say something like, let's see, does 11 and we can do, we need eight more, five and eight, or five and three works for that. And then 29, we can do 11, 11 and seven. And that leaves us with 20. 
Okay, but is there a faster way of doing this? Because we could certainly list out all of these possible values here. I've gotten rid of them, but I'm gonna show you. C is the only one that we cannot do. But C is also the only one that is an, an even number, which is really interesting. I saw someone in chat says that it has to be odd if we're able to sum up three odd numbers. Notice that if we have odd plus odd plus odd, we're going to get something that is odd, inevitably. And so that means, well, 20 is even. So that means adding three odd numbers together, no matter how hard we try, we're never going to get 20. So that's another way that we can approach this problem and get our answer of C. All righty. Awesome. Yeah, I really like the odd number, odd even number method. When we look at this problem, like my first instinct is I see the stuff about the odd numbers and then I don't try too hard to get into the specifics. The first thing I would think of is in general for odd numbers, what would happen? And sometimes that works, sometimes that doesn't. But for this problem, that ended up helping us a lot with determining the answer. All right, good job, everyone. We are speeding through. Okay, now as more geometric shapes, we have question 10. And here, Michael paints the following solids made out of identical cubes. Their bases are made of eight cubes. And the question is, which solid needs the most paint? So we're trying to find surface area. Let's just establish that in the beginning. We're basically trying to figure out which one has the largest surface area. And if we look here, some of them have more blocks than others but this doesn't necessarily impact the surface area. So what I'm going to do is instead of individually counting each of these squares, I'm going to approach each of these um, 3D figures as one side. So for example, if I look at say B, I'm gonna look from the front side right here. And if I look here, that's gonna be six, or actually that's eight. And same thing as if I look from the top down, that's also eight. And from the back, that's eight as well. And from the bottom, that's also eight. And then outside, we have three going that way and then three coming this way. So that's the general idea we're going to look like, look at. And all of these figures kind of have a similar surface area, right? This one actually ends up being the least because if we look at here, it's the same eight. We have eight on the sides, but we have four on the front and the back. So I'll label that real quick. This is eight, eight, and three. Here we have eight, eight, and four. Same thing down here at E. It's also eight, eight, and four from looking from one side. There's six faces. We look at all six. Same thing for C. Even though it has a lot of blocks, it's still just eight, eight, four. But the thing for A now is that we can't just look from one direction now because there are two hidden faces on the inside. So that's an extra face right there. And then looking this way, that's okay. I don't know how to point, but that's an extra face as well. So this one actually has eight, eight, four, and then opposite sides plus the two extra in the middle. So that's why a should be the one that needs the most paint. Awesome. Wow. And I really like the way Aiden did this because you certainly can count up the surface area of each of these shapes here, but that's kind of cumbersome, especially when you have five different options. So the way Aiden did it was he realized there's a shortcut with how the cubes are arranged in each of these diagrams, and that gave a really nice solution. And I see you guys in the chat. You guys are doing amazing. So definitely keep up that activity. Okay, so let's take a look at, guessing it's number 12. Yeah, okay, number 12. So... Ooh, it's about a frog. Riri, the frog, usually eats five spiders a day. And when Riri is very hungry, she eats 10 spiders a day. And she ate 60 spiders in nine days. So on how many days was she very hungry? Okay, this looks like we should set some variables because there's a few things that we don't know right now. So the things we do know, though, is that she normally eats five spiders a day. But when she's really hungry, she eats 10 spiders a day. The thing that we don't know right now is how many 
how the days are distributed within the two. So I'm seeing conflict between Bs and C in, in the chat. So let's see which one it is. So let's set X be the days that she eats five spiders a day, and then Y be the number of days that she eats 10 spiders a day. Well, if I have five times X, well, X is the number of days that she normally eats a normal number of spiders, and five times that is going to be the total number of spiders that she eats from the normal days. And with a similar logic, 10Y is going to be the total number of spiders that Riri eats if she's really hungry. And so if we add these two together, we should get the total number of spiders. So, and we know that's 60, so let's set that equal to 60. But we can't really do much with one equation because we have two unknowns. So the other piece of information that we haven't used is that she ate it in nine days. And the total number of days is going to be x plus y. So we know that x plus y is equal to nine. From here on out, we can solve this equation. And so we want to know how many days she was very hungry. So we're looking for y here. So let's try to get rid of x. So if we multiply this second equation by 5, we get 5x plus 5y is equal to 45. And now we can eliminate all the x's. So if we subtract these two equations from each other, we get 5y is equal to 15. Therefore, we get that y is equal to 3. And that is the number of days that she was very hungry. So it looks like that's going to be C. Awesome. Yeah. I think one of the hardest things about looking at a math problem is deciding when to just think about it and try to figure out some smart way to do it and when to pull out the variables. But I think this is a great problem to pull out the variables and do some good work there because it was efficient, it was quick, and we got our answer. So that was very awesome. Thanks, Shelly. All right, next question, question 14. It looks like we're over halfway there and we've barely made it past 10 minutes. All right, but they're gonna get harder. So let's keep going. This one, five equal squares are divided into smaller squares. Which square has the largest white area? Okay, here we go. One way we could do this, there's always the easy and the hard way, right? One way we could do this is to calculate the exact fraction for each of these squares, right? Like one thing I could see is A is one half, it's half of it, right? And then B, that ends up being five ninths because I can see there's five and there's nine total. Okay. But then when we get down here, the numbers become a little bit more big, right? And it's doable, of course, but I think there's a better method. So first things first, we can Im immediately eliminate A because we know A is just half of it, right? But B, it's a little bit more than half because we have this middle square right here. So Think about it this way. If we pair each of these up, like white, black, white, black, white, black, white, black, we're going to have an extra white here. So that's how we know B is a little bit over one half. Now, same thing with, so C here, let's take a look at C. C here is exactly one half again, and that's because there are an even number of sides. So what we can eventually do now is we can see if they're an odd number, it's going to be a little bit over one half because there's that center square. If it's an even number, it's going to be exactly half. So now I can eliminate C and D is an odd number, but it looks like E is an even number again. So E is also one half. And now the question remains, is the D, is it D or is it B? How we can approach this now is to think about how much extra over one half there actually is. So for B here, we basically have a whole extra white square, right? Because on the border, each of these can be paired with another white-black combination, and that's half. So B, we have an extra white square here. And D, it's almost the same logic. 
We can pair the whites and blacks along the border and the second border, but we end up with one extra white square in the middle right here. So B has one extra white square, D has one extra white square. However, the white square for D is much smaller than the white square for B. That means the amount D is over one half by is a little bit or much less less than B. So in fact, the answer here would be B. Wow, awesome. that was pretty neat. So this is another one of those visual problems where you look at it and you're like, what is going on? But like Aiden did, he noticed the symmetry within this problem, which made it really nice. So awesome. And we never really counted the squares once. Okay. Yeah. So I feel like I feel like I've been doing all the visual problems today. <laughs> yeah, oh, it gets you though. a different type. <laughs> For sure. All right, let's see. Maybe the next one will be a visual one. Okay, not this time, but maybe next time. So in the garden of a witch's, oh, okay, there are 30 animals. There are dogs, cats, and mice. And the witch turns six of the dogs into cats. And then she turns five of the cats into mice. So now the number of dogs, the number of cats, and the number of mice in her garden are all equal. How many cats were at the beginning? Okay, this is a lot of information. We don't know how many dogs, cats, or mice there were at the beginning. But the thing that we do know is that the number of all the animals at the end are all equal. And so we also know that the number of animals total never change because whenever she turns like one cat into a mouse, well, one of the animals goes away but it comes back as a different animal. So none of the animals actually ever disappear. So we always have 30 animals. And because there's an equal number of each of these animals at the end, we know that there's going to be 10 of each. So 10 cats or 10, let's do it in order. So 10 dogs, 10 cats, and 10 mice. Okay, what we can do here is we can maybe move backwards. So this is what happens at the very end. So let's look at the second stage. So the second stage, that's when she turns five cats into mice. So this is equivalent to taking the end stage and turning five mice back into cats. So let's do that. So five mice into cats. So that means we're going to go from 10 to five mice and from 10 cats to 15 cats, and the number of dogs doesn't change. Now let's check if this operation was done correctly. So from this stage, right, the witch turns five of the cats into mice. So we have 15 cats here and five mice. And then doing this operation, five of the cats indeed turn into mice. So we know we're fine. So let's go back one more step. So that was when the witch turns six dogs into cats onto this step. So if we take the inverse of that, that means that six of the cats go into dogs. So that means, well, now from 15 cats, that goes to nine cats. And then from 10 dogs, that goes to 16 dogs. And then the number of mice don't change at all. So let's make sure that we actually did this correctly. So at the very beginning, the witch turns six dogs into cats. Okay, so six of the dogs are gone here, but five of the cats show up. So that shows this operation. So we've done this step correctly too. Okay, so let's look at what the question is even asking for. The question is asking how many cats there were at the beginning. And Looking at our chart over here, it looks like that's going to be nine cats. So our final answer should be nine. Very nice. Awesome. Yeah. I think the two main crutches of this problem that I really liked were, one, the working backwards. That's definitely a very important problem solving strategy. I'm sure many of you have seen that before. But the other one that I like even more is how Shelley organized it in columns. So if you don't organize this, if you don't have a way of organization for this question, it's really, really hard to try to just do some subtraction and get your answer. 
But once you decide how to organize these numbers into the columns like Shelley did, it immediately, it immediately becomes a lot more straightforward. So that's really awesome. Let's move on. All right, we're getting closer to the end. And look, it's 6.30 or 7.30 or 4.30, depending where you are. Maybe 12.30, I don't know. But this one, let's see. Question 18. Bridget folded a square sheet of paper twice, then cut it twice as shown. How many pieces of paper did she get? So what's happening here is this paper is getting folded in half, um, is getting folded in half again, and then we're cutting it twice. So, okay, my first thought is that I know this is a little bit of a trick question because if I try folding it half, right, and fold it in half again, the natural answer is 16 because you have four layers and you cut it into four pieces, right? So four times four is 16. But I'm not sure that really is, right? Because you folded the paper. So you're going to have some folds that stay together. And even if you cut the middle, maybe this fold on the first layer might still stick to the second fold on the second layer. So that means the answer is going to be less than 16 because we didn't cut it and put it on top. We folded it. That's the key point. So I'm not going to lie. I don't really know how to do this in my head. So I think I'd do what any rational competitor would do. I'm going to grab my paper and fold it and see if I can get some inspiration here. All right. So... Basically, what I'm saying is that when you fold this paper, right, you're not putting it on top of each other. You're kind of creating this, you know, unseparable, unseparable side right here, which means that if I cut it, for example, right, I folded it in half right now. Okay, the lighting is weird. But if I cut it straight down here, it's not going to be two times two. It's actually only going to be two pieces because of this middle fold. So I'm gonna have the first layer and the second layer staying together. So we can do it again. And this is just like in the question, we have four layers now. Um, The thing is, I suppose if you're in contest, the best thing would be to rip, right? Like the answer is two cuts away. And you can just rip it off and then see how many. So I'm actually going to use a scissor right now because I have it close to me. But I'm going to cut it in the middle once. Okay, the other piece flew off, but I'm going to stick it back on and then I'll cut it twice. Okay, now's the fun part. I have a bunch of sheets of paper here now. Okay, here are the sheets. And now I get to count how many there are. So we have one. Two, these are all singles actually. Three, this is also just a single sheet. Four, single sheet. Okay, five, this one is not a single sheet. This one is connected by the old fold line. Six, same situation here. It's two of the single sheets connected by a fold line. Seven, okay. Same thing here, seven, eight. And then I actually have one more that's connected by two fold lines. That means this one's actually four of those tiny sheets. But in all, that would be nine sheets of paper. So in fact, by experimentation, I think the answer is nine. Do you have actual paper to do this in the contest? Yeah, so I'm pretty sure, like, unless you live in like a hyper super tech world where they give you iPads for scratch paper, Usually, I think they give you a lot of paper, right? And this is kind of hard to do in your head. Like, I'm not going to lie. Like, I wouldn't be able to do this in my head, like cutting in my head. So if I was in contest, I legit would take a piece of paper, fold it, and rip it. <laughs> so yeah, practical skills. I think that's what this problem is about. What do you think, Shelly? Yeah, that's what I did too. I, I was trying to kind of <laughs> visualize what, what was, like, you could see, like, I was trying to draw the lines of, like, how many folds there are. And I think you can definitely 
do with that. Um, but I ended up also doing the paper after I saw you, Aiden, because I was like, I mean, they surely will give us scratch paper, right? <laughs> yeah, you can rip the iPad for paper. That's a good idea as well. <laughs> yes, for sure. Um, yes, skits. I don't know how that would work, but yes, whatever you need to do. Okay, that was a fun problem. All right, let's take a look at the next one. Aiden, you've been getting all the visual ones because this one, it was another visual one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think they do a thing where like, what is it? The zero or two mod four ones? The two mod four ones are all visuals. Yeah. Ooh, okay. This one might break the pattern because this one looks kind of visual. Let's see. So... Each of the following pictures, and this is number 20, by the way. So each of the following pictures, it shows a net of a cube. And only one of these resulting cubes has a line with connected endpoints drawn on it. So which one? OK, we could technically, right, we could technically build a cube with paper. But it might actually take longer to do it physically. I wonder if we could draw on the paper instead. So. Let's try that. So looks like this is the kind of problem, like just looking at this, none of the cubes really pop out to me as, oh yeah, this one definitely has their endpoints connected. So let's go through each of them. I'm seeing a lot of you are saying B and D, so I saw a not A in the chat. So let's see why it's maybe not A. I saw not C as well. So let's look at why it's maybe not either of those. So let's take a look at A. So if we draw a cube right here, it's been a while since I've done an art class, so you have to forgive my cube. So we draw a cube here. We're going to have to kind of assign one of the sides over here to be the bottom. So just for the sake of making this easier to visualize, let's make this side, this bottom hanging side here. Let's make that the bottom side. So if this kind of like folds over inwards. OK, this is going to be kind of hard. So let's take a look at what exactly is going on. Maybe we can use the square above as the reference point. Let's use this as the reference point. So let me highlight what's going on. So this square, if we have it as our reference point, that's going to refer to this front facing side on this cube over here. So if we draw that out, looks like this curve is going to go like that. And then from there, we can draw the connecting curve. And it looks like it's going to do something like this. So the curve goes kind of well down like that. OK, and then the curve wraps around the cube on one side and then goes back down. So it wraps around the cube this way and then goes back down. So the endpoints are here and here. And looks like that's not connected. So A is out. So let's cross that one out. And this one was for A. OK, and now for B, let's take a look at that one. So we're going to have to draw another cube. All right, for B, this one doesn't look as difficult to visualize just because the line doesn't have that many curves going around. Um, it's not easy, so we'll still have to do it. So let's take a look. So let's take this bottom hanging side as the bottom of the cube. And this design actually looks really similar to what was going on in A. Right? Notice how there's this kind of S shape starting from the top left and then curving down to the bottom right. So we could do something similar with the cube here. So let's let these two sides. Let's set this side over here. Let's let that be this side on this big cube. So again, it's going to kind of curve and then go down on this side, just like what we did for here. OK, and then it's going to wrap around the cube uh, two other sides. So one full side here, one full side here. And then it's going to curve up onto the top of the cube. Well, if it's going to curve up onto the top of the cube and our endpoint is at the bottom here, there's no way that the endpoints are going to be connected because the endpoint's right here. That's not on the top face. So that means B is also doesn't have its endpoints connected to each other. So we can also rule that one out. 
Okay, and so let's take a look at C now. So C, let's draw another one of these diagrams. So C over here, what's going on with C? And this time, whoa, this one looks really interesting. So with C, let's take a look at what happens if this one, if this side was the bottom side. So that means the square above is going to be the front facing side. So in this case, let's let this be the front facing side. So the curve looks like it's gonna go up this way, up this way, and then maybe up that way. And then the curve at the bottom looks like it's gonna go back over here. So again, the endpoints are not connected. And I see a lot of you saying it does not work in this situation. So C is also out. Let's take a look at D. I've seen a lot of you saying D from the start. So let's take a look at that. D, when we draw the cube for this one, let's see what happens here is that, okay, let's let this bottom side be the bottom side of the cube. So then this square highlighted in orange is the front facing side. So looks like this one is gonna go up here and then up this side over here and then straight forward on the top side. So all the way connected like this. And then as for the bottom side of the cube, it's gonna go curve this way on this edge of the cube and then up. And it looks like for this one, it does actually meet the endpoints. And another way that we could have done this is if we wrap the three sides from the start and then kind of visualize how it folds, we see that the endpoints do actually meet with each other at this 90 degree angle. So actually D does work. Let's take a look and make sure that E doesn't. So let's take a look at E. We're almost done here. So with E, our last cube that we're going to draw is this here. And then let's make this bottom side, or let's make this side over here the forward facing side. So now it's gonna curve up from the bottom side this way, and then across, and then back down. And then it looks like on the bottom side, it's gonna go like this way. And then it looks like it's not going to quite curve for the endpoints to meet. So it's also not going to be E. And after all that work, it's going to be D. All right, awesome. Yeah, that's perfect. I'm really impressed with your 3D drawing skills. <laughs> it's very difficult to visualize. I think it would, <laughs> it might actually, another way you could maybe check it is if you built a paper cube, but this is another approach that you could try. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Okay. So, okay. It looks like we might have broken our streak of visual versus non visual problems. So, I'm going to be solving what looks like an algebra problem now. Six identical black beads and three identical white beads are arranged on weighing skills as shown in the picture below. What is the total weight of these nine beads? Okay, so two scales, that means two equalities. What we're going to do here is I'm going to decide that we're not going to just deduce the answer out of randomness. We're going to set some variables. So here I'm going to call the... Let's see, the correct word is weight. Yeah, I was wondering whether to say weight or mass. Or actually, I don't know. I don't know, it doesn't matter. We're gonna call the weight of the white beads X and we will call the weight of the black beads Y. So there's XXX here, Y, X, and then we have some numbers. I don't know if you can see them, but it says 30 grams here and it says six grams here. I'll make that clear. Six grams, 30 grams. Perfect. So now, now we can set up our equations because we have two variables and two balanced scales. So the first one, that would be 2x equals 2y plus 6. And the bottom one would be 3x plus y is equal to x plus 30. Actually, the smart thing I probably should have done is just canceled one X first. So I'm going to do that and cancel this X here and cancel this X here. 
So, oh, actually, you guys might not be able to see the bottom equation because the chat. So here we go. I'll rewrite it up here. We have 2x is equal to 2y plus 6. And down here, we have 2x plus y is equal to 30. What I'm going to do now is I can just directly substitute the 2x into this equation because we have 2x equals this, and then we have 2x in here. So that will become 2y plus 6 plus y is equal to 30. And now it's just solving some equations. 3y plus 6 is equal to 30. And 3y is equal to 24. So y is equal to 8. And that'll be in grams. 8 grams is each of the black beads. So in order to find x, what we can do is we can take y equals 8, plug it back in here, and that gets 2x is equal to 2 times 8 plus 6. That would be 22. And then we would get x is equal to 11. Yeah. So now we have to figure out what the answer is. Because we solved our equation, we have our x and y's. Now we need to figure out what is the answer to this question. So we want the total weight of all nine beads. And it says here, six black beads and three white beads. So that'll be six of the eight plus three of the 11. Sum that up. This is 48. This is 33. We get 81. So which answer choice is that? Oh, did I do something wrong? Oh, Let's I see. also got 81 on this one. So, huh. hmm. So, it looks like, what do you guys think? Yeah. Okay, it looks like you guys are saying the answer is E. So, is there an extra 9 somewhere that I forgot? X is 11. Y is 8. That does satisfy our equations. 48 plus, yeah, so let's see. Black beads in the question mean white beads. Oh, okay, so it looks like, I see, okay, I see. Yeah, I shouldn't have trusted the pictures so much. Maybe it was in high contrast mode when they did it or something. But it looks like the white beads in the picture are actually the six identical black beads. So that makes sense now. That makes sense. In fact, this will be opposite instead. So that means we will have three of the eights and six of the elevens. So in this case, that'll be 24 plus 66 and that's 90 grams. Okay, I agree with you guys completely now. The answer is E, 90 grams. So yeah, lesson to be learned is that words always matter more than pictures. And since there are six white beads, that's actually the six black beads. Awesome. Ooh, yeah, that's a tricky one. So <laughs> yes, exactly as Aiden said, trust the words because the diagram can definitely throw you off. Seems like you guys got it, though. You were able to switch that mentally in your brain. So great job, you guys. All right. So let's take a look at our next question, which is, ooh, okay. So Benjamin writes an integer in the first circle and fills the other five circles following the instructions below. And seems like that's given to us here. So how many of the six numbers in the circles are divisible by three? Okay, so we only care about divisibility by three here. So I wonder if we can write the integers in terms of like how three is multiplied to something and then adding some sort of remainder. So for example, like three x, is representative of values that are a multiple of three or three X plus one, which are values that um, that have a remainder of one when divided by three or three X plus two. And these numbers have a remainder of two when divided by three. 
So because we don't know exactly what integer it is, x is a pretty safe option because x can be any integer in this case of the problem. So let's take a look. We've got three cases that we want to deal with. And so looks like with the first operation, we're going to add one. So that's going to be 3x plus 1 in our first case if we started with a multiple of 3. And then with the second case, we have 3x plus 2. With the third case, we have 3x plus 3. OK, but actually what's going on here is that 3x plus 3 is also a multiple of 3. In fact, if you take out a 3, you get 3 times x plus 1. So actually what we can do here is rewrite 3x plus 3 as 3 times something instead of carrying this extra 3 here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write 3x and then prime just to not get the x's confused. So let's take a look at what happens next. And I'm going to switch colors at this point so we don't get confused. So with our next step, we add 1 once again. And so we get 3x plus 2. And then 3x plus 3, which is exactly what happened down here. Now I'm going to write 3 prime, or 3x prime, so that this is representative of a multiple of 3. And then 3x prime plus 1. All right, and now we're multiplying by 3. OK, multiplying by 3, that means no matter what we have as an integer, we're going to get a multiple of 3. So we can actually rewrite all of these values as 3 times something. It kind of gives a, a reset. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write it as 3h for all of these. Set it as a new variable. It doesn't mean that all three of these numbers are equal to each other. It's more of like a representation that they're all multiples of 3. OK, and after that, we add 2. So actually what happens from now on, because they all start with a multiple of 3, no matter what we do to these values, we're going to get something with the same remainder when divided by 3. So they all kind of combine into one case. So we add 2 next. So we get 3h plus 2. And then after that, we finally multiply by 2. And doing so, that gives us 6h plus 4. And this is not divisible by 3 because 6h has to be divisible by 3, but 4 has a remainder of 1 when divisible by 3. So now let's take a look at each of these cases. So with these last two terms, they're never going to be divisible by 3. But here, we're always, we have something that's divisible by 3 in all three of these cases. So let's circle that. And then over here, the second case is a multiple of 3. So let's circle that here. And then moving back once more, we have a multiple of 3 right here. So let's circle that. And then finally, within this column over here, only the first case, when we start with a multiple of 3, is it going to be a multiple of 3. So let's take a look at each of these cases now. So let's look at each of the rows. So in our first row, when we start with a multiple of 3, we get uh, a multiple of 3 at the start and also right here. We don't get a multiple of 3 anywhere else. And then with the second case, we don't get a multiple of 3 until this step. And then we get a multiple of 3 again when we've multiplied by that 3. And so again, there's two multiples of 3 in this sequence. And then with our last sequence here, when we start with something that has a remainder of 2 when divided by 3, we get a multiple of 3 right here, and then we get another multiple of 3 down here. So it looks like no matter what we start with, we're always going to get two values in the circles that are divisible by 3. And it looks like you guys are saying C, so I'm going to trust you guys. And we also got C here, so looks like that's what we got. Great. That is... These are some, this is actually something really neat to notice about the three and one of them having to be a multiple of three. That that type of thinking will help you in the future. Let's just say that. Okay, next one, 26. So looks like we have, this is our third to last one maybe, but we'll see. So this one, 
Emily took selfies with her eight cousins. Each of the eight cousins is in two or three pictures, and in each picture there are exactly five of、Ella、Emily's cousins. How many selfies did Emily take? So, this is another another number three problem, and two things that we're going to do here. First thing, what I want to do is I want to bound it, and by bound it, I mean what is the highest possible number of photos and what is the least possible number of photos. So let's first think about it this way. Suppose I laid all the photos flat on a table, right, and I counted how many people are there. I'm first going to bound that number. I'm first going to decide how many total people, including repetition, are involved in all of these photos. So here it says each of the eight cousins is in two or three pictures. So that means the most amount of total people I can count is eight times three. Because that's basically eight cousins. Each of them did the maximum number of pictures, which is three. So it's less than or equal to twenty-four. And on the other hand, if each of the eight cousins does the minimum number of pictures, that's a minimum of sixteen total counts. So now, the important thing is now it now we have an additional piece of information that we haven't used yet, just yet. And that piece of information is here. In each picture, there are exactly five of Emily's cousins. So that means the total number of people I can count is a multiple of five. Right? Think about it. If I have all my pictures laid on a table, right? We just gave the lower and higher bound. If I put all the pictures on the table, each picture has exactly five cousins. And there's an integer number of pictures. That means there's going to be a multiple of five amount of total people. And if we look at this range, the only multiple of five in between here is twenty. So twenty, five people in each picture. Twenty divided by five. That would be four. Answer choice B. All right. Great. Yay! And I really like the way Aiden did this because when you first look at this problem, there's just so many possibilities to consider because each of the eight cousins can either be in two or three of the pictures. So that's already really overwhelming if there isn't like any bounding that like Aiden did. So that was a really nice approach to this problem that cut down a lot of the work for us. All right, so. Let's like take a look at our second to last problem, which is number twenty-eight, which is what we have right here, right now. So every digit on my twenty-four digit or twenty-five, wow, not twenty-four digit. That's a very strange clock. Anyway, twenty-four hour digital clock is composed of at most seven digital display parts, as follows here. But unfortunately, for every digit that the display has. Two the same two digital parts that are not working. So at this moment, the clock is showing this. And so, what is it going to show after three hours and forty-five minutes? Okay, I don't know about you, but none of the numbers here look recognizable right here. So we're gonna have to do some puzzling on this one. So let's take a look. None of these numbers really match up to the ones up here. But one thing to notice is that. With our first slot, oh, it's kind of hard to see the numbers. Okay, so let me draw it out here. So with the first number, it's got three bars that looks like this. So three horizontal lines. And our second, it's something like this. And then with our third one, it's kind of like a snake shape. And then the last one is something like this. So, all right. Now that we have that, something interesting to notice is that this first. Value over here is going to have three horizontal lines, and there's not that many numbers up here that have three horizontal lines. In fact, only two, three, five, six, and eight and nine fall under these categories. So let's take a look here. If our first digit is two, that means that these two horizontal displays. Let me actually use a more distinguishing color. Um, so let me use pink. So that means these two displays are not working, and that seems to be consistent with the other ones. So these ones they don't have 
displays here either, and they don't have displays here, they don't have displays here. Okay, so two seems possible. So let's take a look at two, just for the sake of this. So two looks like these two are broken. And then for the next number, well, maybe only one of these is the actual number, right? This, for example, if we had something like one, right? And only this one, and we have that this one and this one is broken, this one is off anyway. When we have a one, this doesn't even light up. So we're just going to see this vertical line here. And maybe that's what's going on right here. The number only uses one of these horizontal values because I don't know about you, I've never seen a number that looks like this. So it's probably only one vertical line. So if we have, actually, if we just have this line over here, that looks like a three. And then maybe let's move on to the next one. So again, this looks more like an H than a number. So maybe there's only one vertical line here. And in this case, if we just have this vertical line that's broken, then we have a four. That's a number that we know. Okay, and let's look at our last number. So this and this are broken. Again, this does not look like a number we are familiar with, but in fact, if we only have this one that's lit up over here that's broke, that turns out to be broken, then we have a seven. So it looks like our time is going to be 2347. Okay, but that's not what the question is asking. We want to know what it will show after three hours and 45 minutes. So if we just ignore the fact that there are 24 hours in a day for now, we're gonna get something like, if we add three hours, we're going to get 2647, and then adding 45 minutes, if we add 45 minutes to that, we're going to get something like a 92 here, but 92 minutes doesn't exist. So we have to shift that again to the hours. So we get 2632. Because there's 60 minutes in an hour, I can subtract 60 from that 92 and actually transfer that to the hours. So now we have 27. 32. Let me write that up here. So 27, 32. But 27 is not an hour that we are familiar with, so we have to rotate through a 24 hours. And to do that, we can subtract out a 24 to get 332. So I don't see a 332 here. So again, the clock is broken at this point, so we have to take that into account. So if we write out what the time would look like, it would be something like zero, three, three, and two. And we know that this bar up here and this bar down here are broken. So it's gonna look something like this is missing, this is missing, this is missing, and that's already not there, so we don't need to worry about that. Same thing with this one. And then with the two, we're going to get are three middle bars. So let's take a look if any of these choices match up. So it looks like we've got A, E, and B, and it looks like, looks like that, let's see, it looks like A is going to be the one that matches because this is exactly what we have up here. And it looks like a lot of you are saying A. All right, awesome, awesome. All right, so we have one more problem left and we're over time, but let's see, do you guys want to review the last problem or do you guys want to go eat dinner or something? Okay, let's do the last problem real quickly. Okay, this one. So, okay, Zev has two machines. One makes one white token into four red tokens and the other makes one red token into three white tokens starts with four white tokens. After 11 exchanges, he has 31 tokens. How many of those are red? Okay, I know how to do this one. So basically, the it doesn't really, it doesn't matter too much about the red token, white token, whatever this thing is, right? What matters is that one machine increases your number of tokens by three. The first one, the white to red, it goes, you start from one white, and you go to four red. That increases the number of tokens by three. Second one, 
one red token into three white tokens. That increases your number of tokens by two. So they just keep increasing tokens, right? So I'm going to set some variables. X will be the times I use machine. I don't know what to call it. I'll call it one to four. That's the number of times I use this machine. Y will be the number of times I use the one to three machine. Okay. So we know that we start with four white tokens and we end up with 31 tokens. So we increased a total of 27 tokens. So the number of times I use X, I have to multiply that by three because each time I increase by three. So the total I increase from this machine will be three X. For Y, similar logic, I increase by two and I do it Y times. So I add two Y as the number of tokens I increase. The total is 27 because that's how many tokens that I increased. Now, the other piece of information is the 11 exchanges. That means we did X plus Y, and that would be equal to 11 because I did this machine X times and this machine Y times. In total, that is 11 times. And now we just have system of equations again. I'm going to multiply the second one by 2. 2x plus 2y is equal to 22. I'm going to subtract. I'm going to get x is equal to 5 and plug x back into here, or actually here, y would be equal to 6. So now the question's asking, how many of those are red? OK, yeah, I have to do a little bit more work. But I start with four white tokens. Um, each white token. Uh, okay, each white token has to become some red tokens. So the white token, I put the... Wait a moment. Oh, actually, I think an easier way to do this is that this one goes from white to red. So since I use this machine, uh, what is it? I use it X is... I use it five times. And then I increase, um, I get four red tokens each time. So that's five times four equals 20. But then this one, I use it, sorry, I can't remember numbers very well. I use it six times. Okay. This one, I use it six times. In goes a red token. So I actually lose six red tokens from this one. But that means I have a net gain of 14 red tokens. So indeed, it is C, just as you guys are saying. Awesome. And that is all the problems of, well, one half of the problems of 2019 Math Kangaroo grades five and six. I hope you guys enjoyed this. And yeah, Shelly, anything else? That's all for this one. Hope you guys enjoyed this one and we'll see you guys in some other live solve, maybe in one of our classes, just sometime in the future. All right. Thank you for coming and participating so amazingly in chat and we'll see you guys in the future. All right. Yeah. Bye everyone. Bye everyone.